When you're generalizing from one area of expertise, the first half of the course when we looked at single variable functions, I think we all got pretty comfortable with the idea of derivatives and optimization there. It's important to see what things do generalize well when you expand it out, in this case here, to functions of multiple variables. What we're gonna see is that there's some things we could say about a function of one variable that don't apply to functions of two variables. Let's do a simple analysis here first. We've got a function that has a combination of x's and y's, and we're asked to find the critical points. So, not a problem. Find the critical points. We're going to need the derivatives, the two partial derivatives with respect to x and y. Uh, the x derivative will be 2x, 1 minus y cubed. The y derivative will be x squared times 1 minus y squared times the 3 for bringing the 3 down, plus 2y. And we're going to set those equal to zero because we're looking for critical points. And what does that give us? It gives us 2x, 1 minus y cubed. Sorry, the y cubed is on the outside, or the cube is on the outside. That makes a difference. Oh, it makes another difference here. This should be a negative because we differentiate the inside here and we get negative 1. All right, so 2x1 minus y cubed is 0. Down here we have negative 3x squared, 1 minus y all squared, plus 2y equals 0. So here there's no easy cancellations, but we, what we can say right off the bat is either x equals 0 or y equals 1. That's the only way to get a 0 derivative in the x direction x has to be 0, then the whole thing is 0, or y equals 1, so that's 0. There's no other options. So what we can do is plug that into our second equation and see how that works out. So if x equals 0, then our critical point in the second part has to be defined by satisfying this equation. We'd have 0 times 1 minus y all squared plus 2y equals 0. And we see that that only gives us y equals 0. So x and y, those two values tell us that, that the origin is a critical point. What about if, uh, if y were equal to 1? If y were to equal 1, then we would have minus 3x squared times 0 plus 2 times 1 equals 0 or 2 times 1 equal hold on <laughs> that's impossible right so if that's impossible which means that there's no critical point with y equal 1 what we said was, well, if y equals 1, we get a crazy contradiction, something that makes no sense. There's no possible way I could choose an x value to make this equation satisfied. And if that's the case, then uh, y can't be equal to 1. So we made an assumption. It led to something crazy. The assumption must be wrong. The assumption must be incorrect. Those two things together tell us that 0, 0 is the only critical point. There we go. Okay, so we have a function with a single critical point at the origin. What could be simpler? Let's take a look at what else we can say here. Let's see that, <clears throat> show that that point is a local minimum. <clears throat> Excuse me. Show that the critical point is a local minimum. Well, for that, we need our second derivatives. And we're just gonna flip back here for a second. The x derivative was this. If we take another x derivative, we're going to get our 1 minus y cubed only. The y second derivative, we'd have to differentiate this. Here it is, a little more simply written out. With respect to y, we'll get a minus 3x squared and two of those and a 2. So a minus 6x, 1 minus y to the power 1 minus 2. And the mixed derivative, let's take the y derivative of this expression, 
Nope, we're going to get another negative sign for that. I'll fix that in a moment. Uh, we're going to have the y derivative of this. We'll bring the 3 down front, get 1 minus y squared. So 2x times 3, 1 minus y all squared times negative 1. And this one also has a negative 1 in it. So those are our derivatives. Let's tidy those up a little bit. That one's fine. This one, negative, negative, we've got 6x, 1 minus y, minus 2. And here we've got negative 6x, 1 minus y, all squared. All right, at the point 0, 0, though, which is our critical point, we have this is going to be 1, 0, that's going to be negative 2. And this is going to be 0. Let me just double check something here, because that's not the sign I was expecting. <laughs> ah, found it. Taking a look at this expression here, I looked at this plus y squared and asked, what happens if we differentiate that twice? We should have positive values here. Let's just confirm that. Going back to our fy, we had plus 2y, plus 2y. When we differentiate that, it should be positive. So let's go back to here and correct that. Positive, positive, and so we get positive 2 here. Okay. What does that tell us about our discriminant value for the second derivative test? Again, we take the product of these two things, 1 times 2, minus the second derivative with x and y, all squared. We get 2, which is positive. That means the concavities are the same. And also we get uh, fxx is positive. That's concave up. So we have two concavities that are both positive, concave up. So it tells us that 0, 0 is a local minimum of our function. Okay, so far simply another application of our identification of critical points and then classification of it using this d value. Why do we bring this example up at all? Because I can't advance pages here. There we go. Is the local minimum we found a global minimum or a local minimum? Hmm. Well, again, we saw something, we see something here that we saw in an earlier example. We had this cube function, right? If x is constant and y goes towards, well, let's go to positive infinity, say, it gets its sign flipped by this negative, but we have negative large numbers. f is going to approach, well, what's it going to approach? It's going to approach negative infinity. The sign will flip, but the value will get larger and larger because of that cubed. And as y goes towards negative infinity, this 1 minus y all cubed is going to go towards positive infinity. It's going to be the most important term in the uh, function. Well, as soon as we see this, this tells us that there's no point that's a local or global minimum. Now we're interested in global properties. because I can always go lower by increasing y. And if the values are getting larger and larger along this path anyway, this tells us also that no point can be a global maximum. No single point is ever going to have a highest value because we can always go higher by going further along this axis. Now why is this interesting? Well, I should have said I was going to pause this at the uh, first picture here. What we have here is a function with a local minimum and no other critical points. That's the function we just looked at. Let's try to see if we could have built something like that with single variable functions. Okay, we have a critical point, slope zero. It's a local minimum. Is there any way to build a function with that where this is not the global minimum? Well, 
let's take a look. If the function behaves normally, like it's continuous and has continuous derivatives, the only way to get lower than this point is to turn around and go down, right? But we can't do that. Why can't we do that? Because if we did do that, pardon me, come on. I give up. Uh, we can't do that because then we would add a second critical point. So before, if we had a single local minimum and the function was well behaved, we could guarantee that that was the single lowest point of the entire function because of the, other, the lack of other critical points, which would be transitions or turnaround points for the function. If I wanted to go back down again, I have to turn and I can only turn at a critical point. That's where we're going to go uh, through a local max and turn around from increasing to decreasing. Same on the other side. If we had it going this way to go down on the other side of our critical point, our local minimum, we would need a second critical point to make that happen or a discontinuity. We'd have to have it go up and then maybe go down like that. That's also bad because that would describe a function that isn't continuous. So having a local min and having it be the only critical point guaranteed that we had a global minimum in a single variable function. Let me just quickly summarize that. No other critical points. And let's add the condition. The function is continuous. And we'll slide this extra condition. The derivative should be continuous as well. That min also has to be a global, a global minimum. Pardon me for one second. There we go. I want to contrast that with the example that we were just looking at with multivariate functions. Here we found a minimum at 0, 0. We analyzed it. We said, yep, that's a local minimum at 0, 0. That's perfect. But that local minimum is not a global minimum. Our only critical point at 0, 0 is only a local minimum and not a global minimum. How can that work? I mean, how can we have, we've got one point that's a minimum. How can, well, it has to, how can it go down again? How can it do that transition back down to get lower without creating a critical point? Here's where having the flexibility of more variables is it enriches what we can do and what we can see in terms of functions and their surfaces. Let me show you the contour diagram and a surface for this function here. It's a little hard to see in the diagram, so we'll start with the contour diagram. Zero, zero is our point here. That's our local minimum. And we notice that we can go up and up and up out of it. But we also notice that we can go up and then we can start going down. These are all negative values over this way. We can go up to a peak and then we can slide down, but there's no peak along the way. There's no other critical point, not even a saddle, in fact, in this case here. So we can escape the minimum without, you know, what we're doing here is we're kind of sliding around here and back down. We can slide out of the minimum without ever reaching any particular point that's higher than its neighbors. We can go higher always along these axes, but there's no single point that stands out from the rest that distinguishes itself in the surface as a maximum or minimum. So the purpose of this example is simply to illustrate that ideas that we have from single variable calculus sometimes generalize well, sometimes do not generalize well to multivariate functions. And so you have to be careful when you're talking, especially in optimization about the existence of global properties based on arguments around single points or the kinds of arguments we would have made in single variable calculus. And we'll see that uh, play out a bit more as well when we look at the last unit, unit 24. Anyway, just something to bring to your attention to point out the richness that we inherit when we start talking about uh, surfaces rather than single variable functions. It's a different world, related but distinct from single variable calculus.